say you put them in the office. So I'm not going to ask for that. started this afternoon. We're glad you stayed for our afternoon service. We're going to have a good time this afternoon. We're glad you uh, are going to stay with us. I'm sure you got enough to eat. Amen. I got plenty of brisket and chicken and sausage available. So we had a great meal. So we thank all the ladies who are prepared all those plates for us. And I appreciate Brother Chris for cooking all that. We'll recognize them in a minute, I'm sure. It was a really great meal. So if you're involved in that, thank you so much. We're glad you're here. Let's all stand if we can. Number 178, 
Are you washed in the blood and the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Number 178 on the first, second, and last verse together. Have you been to Jesus the cleansing blood? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood and the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? If there's a question mark, let's stop and pause and think. That's what question marks are for, right? You pause and consider. So if you see question mark, we're going to stop singing and stop playing. All right, on the second verse and on the chorus, here we go. With the Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? You can change the slides. There you go. Will your soul be ready for the mansion's bright and be washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood in the soul and the blood of the Lamb? Are you garments by the are they white as snow? Are you white Well done, everybody. On the last verse, like normal. Are you walking daily by the same sign? Are you lost in the blood of the land? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you lost in the blood of the land? Amen. Great job. We're going to sing a song. You can clap on this song if you want to. Give me that old time religion. And we're going to sing a few verses of this. Give me that old time religion. Start with the chorus. There are verses. If you want to clap, you can. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. It's good enough for Good enough for me. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. It's good enough for me. It was good for Pastor Carr. It was good for Pastor Carr. It was good for Pastor Carr. It's good enough for me. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. It's good enough for me. It was good in the fiery furnace. It was good in the fiery furnace. It was good in the fiery furnace. It's good enough for me. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. It's good enough for me. It was good for all our teachers. It was good for all our teachers. It was good for all. Teachers, it's good enough for me. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. It's good enough for me. It was good for Paul and Silas. It was good for Paul and Silas. It was good for Paul and Silas. It's good enough for me. Last time, give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. It's good enough for me. Amen. All right. Well, uh, everybody get enough to eat today. We ran out of meat. Can you believe that? And I hope everybody got fed, so uh, uh, evidently we had a pretty good turnout today and I uh, heard so many comments that the meat, uh, the brisket, and the chicken, and the sausage were delicious. If you agree with that, say a big amen. amen. And uh, I appreciate Brother Chris Coriel uh, putting all the time and effort into cooking that. Brother Chris, why don't you come up here? I got some gift cards for you. And uh, yeah, we...
I've got two $50 Visa cards right there. So thank you, brother. Let's give Chris a good hand again. Did an awesome job. Yeah. And uh, if this EMT stuff doesn't work out, he could open up a barbecue place, okay? And uh, excellent, fantastic job. Uh, I had people say that was the best they've ever had. So somebody says better than Rudy. So you did a great job, Chris. Appreciate it so much, man. Yeah, we're proud of you. And uh, hang on to that smoker, okay? Don't let that smoker get away from you. And uh, we're probably going to do that again sometime. Uh, we did have a gentleman that we dealt with today. He did not get saved. Uh, to pray for him, his name is Jerry. Uh, Roman Catholic background. He probably heard things today he's never heard before. Amen? And uh, he came here, as far as I know, the very first time. And uh, he's still pondering some things, has some questions, wants to talk about it further. That's good. Amen? And uh, I don't believe in this. Repeat this prayer after me. One, two, three. Uh, you know, uh, you're saved now. And they have no idea what they're doing. Uh, it ought to be a conscious decision and choice on your part. Amen? And, uh, you know, that's why it's important we deal, deal with kids. Uh, we don't want to make it complicated for them. The Bible says we're supposed to come like, become like a child, not vice versa. And, uh, and so pray for Jerry, and uh, we're going to get back in touch with him. We have Grow this week, and so we'll make contact with him and, and uh, see if we can answer any more questions for him. Uh, we did have some other unsaved people here today. I think they heard the gospel today. What do you all think? And, uh, you know, we, we, we just we sow the seed. You're always sowing, always putting fish, fish hooks in the water. And uh, I think we're going to see good fruit from this um, in the days and weeks to come, okay? And so, um, and we had lots of guests too. I got uh, even more guest cards after the meal. Appreciate all of you who invited people to come. And if they did not come, don't get discouraged. Keep inviting people, amen? And uh, I didn't go to church the first time I was invited. They had to keep after me. You've heard the story over and over. And I'm so glad they persisted. They did not give up until I finally, out of frustration, I said, I will go just to get you off my back, okay? And so keep bugging them. Amen? Keep bugging them. And uh, bug them all the way into heaven. All righty. Brother Kenny, you got another song for us? Okay, let's sing another song. All right, number 692, when we all get to heaven. If you want to bring something up for the change offering, you can do that. Number 692, change offering, song we sing all. First, second, last verse, number 692. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions, bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and sing the victory. This time, Brother Butch is going to announce the winners of our contest today. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, I, I just want to say I appreciate everybody dressing uh, Western today. Everybody looks really good. Uh, some are more natural than others, obviously. Like us East Coasters, we kind of struggle with it. But uh, I do have, we're going to start with uh, the, the best dress. We've got some, we're going to do some children, teenagers, and the adults. So we'll start with the children first. The children were tough. Um, the teachers and I kind of worked our heads together and we came up with a boy and a girl best dressed. So the little girl best dressed, um, her name is Cielo, Cielo Nahar. So come on up here, Cielo. Kids dressed real good today. And then the little boy 
is Destry Bolin. Yeah. Who's Destry? It's the, the Chaps. It was the Chaps. The, the Chaps did it. That's what they did. If you guys were to wear Chaps, you, more people could have won today if you guys were to wear Chaps. But. All right, teenager, Nick Schmidt. Is Nick in here? There he is. He looks good. He looks good. All right, thank you, Nick. All right, now the adults. The adults were tough, too. There's a bunch of people that did really well. Um, but the winner is going to be Miss Helen Seymour. How about that? Come on up here. Thank you for playing along. Her first time here. It's her first time at a Roundup Day. All right, so now the, um, the visitors. So we've had uh, the, the teenagers, the children. I'm not sure how many we're going to give away, how many cards Pastor has. But uh, thank everybody for bringing visitors today. Um, if you didn't you know, come see me, tell me you had visitors today. I may not have gotten you. But um, we'll work with what we have. So from the teenagers and young people, I uh, miss Maddie. She, come on, Maddie. Maddie had three that came from Sunday school and church. Thanks, Maddie. Now, Pastor, how many cards do you have? Do you want to give rid of some more kids ones, or do you? I'm out of kids' cards. Okay. Oh, that's okay. We, we, we won't mention any more kids until we get to the end. So the adults. Are the birds still here? I think the birds left. So, unfortunately, um, this is kind of a bittersweet day for her. She won this contest on a day that she really didn't want to win this contest. But um, uh, she had nine visitors that came today, so I want to thank you for that. <laughs> and then second place, once again, where's Mr. Coriel again? Had five visitors today. He's up here all the time. <laughs> and then third place, was Pat and Jerry Pearson. Are they in this room? They might be in the other room. So they had, they brought four. They had four. Then I've got three different people who each brought two. Can we do it? These are, these are adults. These are all adults. I got three adults. I had three adults that have two visitors I each. Do we want to keep going or are we going to turn it over to Kenny now? Okay. Sorry, man. <laughs> all right. So first of all, the Schmitz brought two. They're neighbors. So who wants to come up from the Schmidt family? Designate somebody. Designate somebody. It's a long walk for your dad. And then Jenny Juarez. Is Miss Jenny here tonight? There she is. She brought two. And I don't see the Fritzes. The Fritzes brought two as well. Is your parents here? Oh, there they are. There they are right there. The Fritzes brought two. All right, that's all I got. All right. If you brought in a visitor, we're grateful for the participation in that. Uh, let's celebrate or let's recognize any birthdays, anniversaries this afternoon. Anybody celebrating a birthday this week. No gift cards, but we do get to sing to you. Anybody celebrating a birthday this coming week? No birthdays? How about anniversaries? Any anniversaries this week? No birthdays, anniversaries. We don't get to sing to anybody this week. Did you? Oh, man. Yeah. You already raised your hand and said you were liars this morning. We have it on tape. All right. <clears throat> well, let's sing one more time this morning if we can, or this evening. Uh, number 672 in the suite by and by. Let's stand if we can this evening or this afternoon. Number 672 in the sweet by and by, though we'll have another special this, tonight, this afternoon. There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it afar, for the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there in the sweet by and by. We shall be Shore. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. We shall sing on that beautiful shore. The melodious songs of the blessed, and our spirit shall sorrow no more. Not a sigh for the blessing of rest. In the sweet by and by, we 
afternoon you may be seated and before the message tonight or this afternoon Nick and Laura are going to play for us well before we were going to start playing I was supposed to yeehaw but Laura told me no so I'm not going to yeehaw I'm on the count of three I want everybody to yeehaw and if it's not good enough then we'll just do it again okay so ready one Two, three. Yeehaw! That's a good one. <laughs> That's enough make a method of shout. Amen. Thank you so much. That was awesome. That was great. And uh, again, I just want to thank all the folks who worked so hard putting up the tables and chairs yesterday and uh, serving the meal today, cleaning up afterwards. We still got some of that left to do. And uh, in the kitchen, scrubbing pots and pans and carrying trash and garbage out and working the games out there. And uh, we have a new Tomahawk Toss champion. Andrew is our new champion, okay? Yeah. Uh, I saw, yeah, he hit five out of six, okay? And then I'll tell you something else. Did anybody see Savannah throwing the tomahawks? She was sticking those things, and I told Dominic, you better call her ma'am, okay? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'll tell you what, man. I mean, she could hit you from here, brother, okay? So you better be good to her, okay? But uh, we're, seriously, we do appreciate all the folks uh, made it possible. And you know what? We needed a day like this, didn't we? Yeah. 
It's been a while. We needed the fellowship. We needed the food. I don't know about you. I didn't think about COVID the entire time I was eating. I didn't think about the election the entire time I was thinking. Amen. And uh, so we got a good uh, mental break today. We got fed spiritually. We're not done eating spiritually yet. We're about to get the icing on the cake here. And we got to feed our bodies as well. So it's been a great day. Just had a good time, and uh, we need this. Uh, uh, I think going to church ought to be a fun thing to do, okay? And uh, not in a crazy way, but we ought to enjoy it. Uh, I, I saw a thing this week that said they uh, uh, had motion detectors in a Presbyterian church, and they never went off during services. <laughs> okay. My apologies to my Presbyterian friends, but uh, Baptists shouldn't be that way. It was okay for us to clap our hands. Amen. And uh, I appreciate the good, lively music today. And uh, I don't know if you thought about it. We had some young people doing great music for us today. And uh, that's a blessing to all of us old folks, okay? And uh, I know you've got a full belly. You want to go take that nap, but we're going to hear some good preaching first. And, uh, you know, if you have to, like when I'm preaching, if you nod off, that's okay. We won't wake you up, all right? And uh, we might just leave you here, okay? We'll lock the doors and leave you here, let you sleep in peace. But I don't think anybody's going to go to sleep where Brother Kenny's preaching. I enjoy hearing him. Brother Kenny, come preach for us. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Carr. All right. Let's open our Bibles this afternoon to Second Chronicles chapter 32. Second Chronicles chapter 32. And uh, I am mindful of the time. And I do know that usually you guys are probably on the couch watching something or dozing off. And I get the uh, unlikely privilege of preaching after you've already eaten. And so this is going to be a tough one, but we're going to get through it this afternoon. And it was going to be 30 minutes, but after all of the comments about my shoes today, we're looking about to get out at normal time this afternoon, okay? <laughs> right, or should we wind up right around 7 o'clock, amen? All right, so uh, <clears throat> buckle up. All right, amen. And uh, honestly, I don't want to hear any comments on my shoes when our cook has a pink shirt on. All right, that's all I'm saying. All right, anyway. Second Chronicles chapter 32, we're going to find our text here, the first eight verses. We're going to preach a message uh, this afternoon called Circle in the Wagons. Circle in the Wagons from Second Chronicles 32. Let's pick up our text in verse 1. This is uh, the story, one of the stories of Hezekiah, one of the great kings of the Old Testament. The Bible says in Second Chronicles 32 and verse 1, it says, And after these things and the establishment thereof, Sennacherib, king of, the, uh, king of Assyria, came and entered into Judah, and encamped against the fenced cities, and thought to win them for himself. And when Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib was come, and that he was purposed to fight against Jerusalem, he took counsel with his princes and his mighty men to stop the waters of the fountains which were without the city, and they did help him. Verse 4, So there was gathered much people together who stopped all the fountains and the brook that ran through the midst of the land, saying, why should the king of Syria come and find much water? He also strengthened himself, in verse 5, and built up all the wall that was broken and raised it up to the towers and another wall without and repaired Milo in the city of David and made darts and shields in abundance. And he set captains of war over the people and gathered them together to him in the streets of the gates of the city and spake comfortably to them, saying, Be strong and courageous. Be not afraid nor dismayed for the king of Assyria, for, for all the multitude that is with him, for they are more, more than with us. Excuse me, verse, uh, let's read verse 7 again. Be strong and courageous. Be not afraid nor dismayed for the king of Assyria, nor for all the multitude that is with him, for there be more with us than with him. With him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord, our God, to help us and to fight our battles. And the people rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. If you've seen the old movies, maybe read some old uh, Western books, you'll know that when the pioneers were traveling out west, they would sometimes circle their wagons. Sometimes at nighttime, they would put a little fire in the middle, and they would circle their wagons around that fire, and the children could play in the middle. But oftentimes, if there was a threat if there was an enemy coming from the mountains, or if there were wild cowboys coming to steal their goods or steal their gold or their money, they would circle the wagons. And the reason they would circle those wagons together is that would provide a protection and a barrier between them, the pioneers, and those who were trying to attack them. 
So if you've seen those old movies, you've seen them do that. Maybe the old uh, TV, black and white TV shows, they would circle all those wagons up so they could have a defense, so they could have a protection, and so they could have a barrier. Now, in 2 Chronicles chapter 32, what we have is we have Sennacherib, king of Assyria, coming and kind of surrounding Jerusalem. And Hezekiah knows that Sennacherib is not a friend. He's an enemy, and he wants to destroy those in the city. He wants to destroy Hezekiah and those that Hezekiah loved. In chapter 32, when Hezekiah saw that King Sennacherib intended to capture Jerusalem, this godly king immediately went into action to defend the city and its inhabitants. We could say that he began to circle the wagons to protect those that he loved. He saw the threat. He took the proper action. And the Bible says when he did that, he won a great victory. Even though Sennacherib had a large army, the Bible says in the same chapter, verse 21, that they won a victory so great that Sennacherib returned with shame of face to his own land. So what a great victory Hezekiah had. Not only that, but the Bible also says following that victory that the Lord saved Hezekiah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem from the hand of Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, and from the hand of all other and guided them on every side. Now, if we stop right there, I think all of us would want to live inside that circle. If we see a threat that's threatening our spirituality, a threat that's threatening our family, a threat that's threatening some, our walk with the Lord, when we, when we see that threat approaching, I bet all of us want to have a victory so great that that threat leaves with shame and that outside of that victory, the Lord continues to guide us on every hand. That's what happened in chapter 32. Sennacherib came, Hezekiah circled the wagons, they wrought a great victory, and the Bible says that God guided them on every side. All of us want that for our spiritual life. All of us want that for our families. All of us want that in our walk with the Lord. Now, as Christians, we are constantly aware that there is an enemy who wants to hurt us. There's an enemy outside who wants to ruin our testimony, separate us from our family, and cause us to drift away from the Lord. So what can we do when the devil, like a roaring lion, is walking about seeking whom he may devour? What can we as Christians do when we recognize a threat that wants to hurt us, our walk with the Lord, or our family? Well, the answer is when we see that threat, we circle the wagons. We circle those wagons. And what happens when we do this? Well, thankfully, 2 Chronicles 32 gives us three things that happen when we in our Christian life circle the wagons when we perceive that threat. Let's go back to the Word of God. 2 Chronicles chapter 32, verses 2, 3, and 4. Look what the Bible says. <clears throat> the Bible says in verse, or chapter 32 and verse 2, When Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib was come, and that he was purposed to fight against Jerusalem, <clears throat> Hezekiah took counsel with his princes and with the mighty men to stop the waters of the fountains which were without the city, and they did help him. So if we stop right there, imagine the scene, all right? Think about it. Here you are in the west. Everything's dry. Everything's dusty. You've got your town. You've got your, your uh, people there with you. And here in the middle of a hot desert... Is water good or bad? Water's good. You need water, right? So think about it. Here we have Hezekiah, and he's out in this Jerusalem countryside where it's hot, where it's dry, and he says, hey, we need to stop the water. Now, why would he do that in the middle of the, in the, middle of the desert? Why would he stop the water when water in the desert is a good thing? Well, verse 4 shows us. He gathered much people together who stopped all the fountains and the brook that ran through the midst of the land, saying, look at this, why should the king of Assyria come and find much water? Listen, when you perceive a threat and you begin to circle the wagons around your family or circle the wagons around your walk with the Lord, what happens when you do that? Well, number one, when you circle the wagons, you're telling the enemy that he cannot use what belongs to you. He can't use what belongs to you. Water is a good thing in Jerusalem. Water is a good thing in the desert. But Hezekiah says, why should we provide for the enemy? 
If any of you have been in some kind of law enforcement or military background, you know it's very foolish to provide ammunition to your enemy. Amen. You don't say, hey, how you doing on ammo? Uh, two rounds left here. I'll leave a couple mags here. You can use them. I'm going to skedaddle back to behind my car or back with my group. You wouldn't do that. That would be foolish, right? Of course, you would not provide for the enemy. Hezekiah says, why should we provide for the enemy? Water is a good thing, but when the enemy is using it, it becomes a bad thing. Now, Hezekiah had experience with this mindset, something good that can become bad. Remember all the way back with uh, Moses, when he was leading the people of Israel out of Egypt to the promised land. And the Bible says the children of Israel murmured. And when they murmured, God sent fiery serpents. And when those serpents bit the Israelites, the Bible says they died. So answer the question, what was God's remedy for the people that were dying in the desert being bitten by those serpents? What did they make? A brazen serpent. God told Moses, form a brazen serpent, wrap it around a pole, stick it up, and anybody who looks at that serpent, they will live. So was the brazen serpent a good thing or a bad thing? It was a good thing. It was a picture of Jesus. John chapter 3, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. They needed help. They needed salvation, so they made the brazen serpent. That was a good thing. Well, by the time Hezekiah steps on the scene hundreds and hundreds of years later, they still had the brazen serpent. But they were not using it for medicinal purposes. They were worshiping it. The Bible says in the book of 2 Kings chapter 18 that he, Hezekiah, removed the high places and break the images and cut down the groves and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and he called it Nehushtan, a brazen thing. So on Hezekiah's day, was the brazen serpent a good thing or a bad thing? It was a bad thing. Now, it was a good thing when it was used for God's purpose, but the devil, the enemy, took a good thing and made it a bad thing. You understand? Yes. Now, listen, when you circle the wagons, you're telling the enemy, this might not be a bad thing for me, but you're not going to use it. You're not going to use this in my life to separate me from my family or from my God. You cannot use what belongs to me. The brazen serpent was a good thing, but it became a bad thing. There might be some things in your life, listen, that are not necessarily bad, sinful things, but the enemy can use those things to burden you down and to hinder your walk with God. Maybe it's a membership to some gym or some club. Maybe it's a subscription to some magazine or some other thing you might be getting online. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but the devil can use that against you. See if you can fill in the blank on this verse. You ready? You wake? Can you fill in the verses? All right, fill in the blank on this verse. Ready? Here we go. Hebrews 12, verse 1. Listen, I'll say what, and you answer it, okay? Here we go. Fill in the blank. Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which thus will easily beset us. Notice the Bible differentiates weight and sin. Sin is a transgression of God's law. Those things are, are inherently wrong. But some Christians are weighed down with things that really aren't sinful, but they're burdens. They're not necessarily wrong, but they can be used in a wrong way. They hinder you. I have got a lot of comments about my cowboy vans today. All right? Now, let's say I happen to buy myself a really nice pair of cowboy boots. All right? And I began to wear my cowboy boots, and my wife says, Hey, Kenny, I got an idea. Let's run a 5K together. And I'll say, Hey, that's great. I just bought these cowboy boots. These would be perfect. I can break them in. Amen? So I put my cowboy boots on and my, run no, my running pants and my, my running uh, shirt. And they say, On your mark, get set, go. And I take off of my cowboy boots, you know, running down the track. Now, are cowboy boots a good thing or a bad thing? Bad thing? Well, they're a bad thing in that situation, aren't they? Yeah. Is there anything wrong with wearing cowboy boots? No. But when you're trying to run a race, it's a bad thing. I'm not going to try to run a race in cowboy boots. Why are you trying to live the Christian life when you're being weighed down? There are things in your life that are not necessarily bad things, but the enemy is trying to use those things against you. 
There are things in your life that are hindering your walk with God. There are things in your Christian life that are burdening you down so you cannot do what God has called you to do. And what you've got to do is circle the wagons. And you're telling the devil, listen, you cannot use what belongs to me. You cannot use this against my family. I need to spend time with my family so you can't use my membership, gym membership. I've got to spend time with my family so you can't use my gaming system or my phone. I've got to be in church so you can't use this job against me. There are things that you have that you need, but the devil can use. Listen, when you perceive those threats, it's time to circle the wagon. Number two, and oh, we're doing great with time. All right. Second Chronicles chapter 32, been verse five. <clears throat> what happens when you circle the wagons? Number one, you tell the enemy that he can't use what, what, what belongs to you. In verse 5, the Bible says, He also strengthened himself and built up the wall that was broken and raised it up to the towers and another wall without and repaired Milo in the city of David and made darts and shields in abundance. When there's a threat coming to you or your family, your walk with the Lord, you see it on the horizon, you begin to take precautions to gain victory in this area. When you take those precautions... What you're doing is you're building a wall of separation between you and your enemy. If you can picture in your mind this afternoon a movie or a book where they've circled those wagons, you see those, those wild cowboys that are riding, they usually have that black hat and that black horse and they have that black vest. A lot like what Greg Hull was wearing today, actually. All right, a black hat, all black, you know, they have that, that black hat. And of course, the, the good guy has the white hat, right? And the white horse. So imagine the man with the white hat and the white horse inside the circle and all of these black hatted cowboys coming from the mountains to attack these settlers. Now what they're doing is they begin to circle their wagons and they're putting a literal physical barrier between them and that threat. Now I want you to understand this point, all right? <clears throat> because you got to get this, this will be worth the price of your lunch, all right? In the Christian life, there are times when we need to build walls of separation. Amen. We need to build walls to separate us from our threat. Amen. But listen, that wall does not provide a spiritual environment. It protects the environment that you already have. Let me explain it this way. I went to Pensacola. Pensacola is a great Christian college. They had a lot of walls. They had a lot of convictions or standards. But there were a lot of kids who went to that school who were unsaved. Now, they had rules that as a college student, Troy, you had to be in bed by 11 o'clock in college. That can be hard sometimes. Now, there are ways around that. And some of us found those ways, you know. And there were some things you could and could not do off campus. There are some places you were allowed to go. And there are some places you were not allowed to go. So the school, they were very strict. They had a lot of walls, we would say. They had a lot of standards or convictions. But there were still people in that school who did not walk with God. Wait, what? How could you not walk with God with all of these standards? Because those standards did not set up an environment of spirituality. It just protected the environment that was already there. Listen, in the home, just because you have rules and standards and convictions does not mean you have a spiritual home. Those standards protect the environment that you already have. They don't create a spiritual environment. And you have to understand that when Hezekiah circled these wagons, what he was doing was he's protecting that environment that he already had. When you circle the wagons, you put up that wall of separation. When you sense that enemy, it's trying to hurt your relationship with God or your family or your church. It's time to circle the wagons and put that separation between you and your enemy. How many people in here are first generation Christians? That means your parents aren't saved, your grandparents aren't saved, but you're saved. Okay, we've got a few. Okay. How many of you, your parents or your grandparents are saved? Raise your hand. Okay, a lot more second generation Christians than first generation Christians. Here's what usually happens. All right. When someone who's a first-generation Christian gets saved, they don't have the experience that their parents or their grandparents had walking with the Lord. And so they're making their standards and convictions as they go. And when they see an issue, they raise a standard. And then second generation and third generations come along. They're raised in the spiritual home 
And when they see a standard, they raise an issue and say, why do we have to do this? Why do we have to look like this? Why do we have to have this kind of thing in our home? Why can't we watch that? Why can't we read those? Why do we have to do things this way? And the parents say, well, it's because this was an issue. We wanted to protect you from it. The second generation says, but we don't want to do that. That standard separates maybe your home from certain worldliness adaptations inside the home. But it doesn't create a spiritual environment. It just protects the environment that you already have. Listen, if you're a father trying to raise standards for your family, get their heart first. If you're in ministry, a Sunday school class teacher, get their heart first. If you're a wife, get their heart first. But it is important to have these walls of separation so the enemy cannot break and the enemy cannot breach so easily what belongs to you. Number three, very, very quickly, we're going to end here with the third point. What happens when you circle the wagon? So first thing you're telling the enemy, you can't use it belongs to me. They stopped up the wells. You can't use our water. Second thing, there's going to be a barrier. We're going to protect our people. We're going to protect our town. Thirdly, verses 6, 7, and 8. Think about this. Hezekiah set captains of war over the people. So if we would read it, reread it, he stopped the water. He built up the walls. He set captains of war over the people. And now he's gathering them together in verse 6 in the streets of the gate and spake comfortably to them. Now, they're about to go to war. Their city is surrounded. There's a king who's not a friend who wants to attack them. And the Bible says that Hezekiah did not lose his temper. He wasn't reacting with a short fuse. He spoke comfortably to them. That shows great leadership right there. That he was not really afraid because he knew where his victory lied. He spoke comfortably to them. And the Bible says in verse 7, he said, <clears throat> Be strong and courageous. Be not afraid nor dismayed for the king of Assyria, nor for all the multitude that is with him. For there be more with us than with him. Why? Because with him is only an arm of flesh. But with us is the Lord our God, look at this, to help us and to fight our battles. When you circle the wagons around your family, when you circle the wagons around your heart, number three, that shows that your focus is on the only one who can bring total victory. In those old pioneer days, when they circled the wagons, they only had one threat. That thing that was going to attack them. Whether it was those Indians, or those cowboys, or those, uh, those robbers, those thieves. When you circled the wagons, your focus was hyper-focused on only the enemy. In the spiritual life, when you circle those wagons spiritually, your focus automatically should go to the only one who could bring total victory. Now, I want you to see if you can name this movie, all right? I'm going to give you a short summary, and tell me if you can name this movie, all right? It's not a, it is a new one because they remade it, but the better one's back in the 60s, okay? Here we go. In 1880, Frank Ross is murdered and robbed by his hired hand, Tom Chaney. Ross's young daughter, Maddie, travels to Fort Smith, where she hires aging U.S. Marshal Rooster Cogburn to apprehend Cheney. Young Maddie gives Cogburn a payment to track and capture Cheney, who has taken up with outlaw Lucky Ned Pepper. True All right. Grit. What was it? True grit. True grit. Now, if you remember that old movie, here comes young Maddie. She goes up to the Rooster Cogburn, uh, John Wayne, and she hires him because she says, I've heard you have... True grit. She's saying, listen, I know that you have the tenacity and the edge to do what needs to be done, that you'll do whatever you need to do to get the job done. In 2 Chronicles 32, Hezekiah reassures the people that they can win the battery, battle. The people are scared, so Hezekiah speaks comfortably to them. He speaks confidently, but gently and from the heart. And he tells them that they want, if they want to be successful, listen, if they want to see victory, they'll need true grit. You need to be strong and courageous and be not dismayed. If you're going into war with strength and confidence and no fear, that would show true grit, wouldn't it? The Bible 
is full of examples of Christians who exemplified true grit. Matter of fact, if you go to Hebrews chapter 11, very quickly this afternoon, you'll see that this whole chapter is full of Christians who showed true grit. Now, don't zone out. We're almost done. All right. So go to Hebrews chapter 11. All right. If you're still awake, if you're still awake, go to Hebrews chapter 11. If you're asleep, then snore nice and loud so we know where you are. OK, put your head back just like that. All right. Hebrews chapter 11. You'll see a, loop, a group of Christians who faced insurmountable odds but showed true grit in the face of danger. Now remember, when you're circling the wagons, your focus is on the only one who can bring total victory. In Hebrews chapter 11, you'll see examples of individuals, men and women, who showed true grit. Verse 4, Abel. <clears throat> Verse 4, Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice. Verse 5, Enoch was translated. Verse 7, Noah moved with fear and saved much, uh, much people alive. Verse 8, Abraham received an inheritance, obeyed. He called to go out and obeyed. Verse 11, Sarah received strength and delivered. Verse 17, Abraham again offered up Isaac. Verse 20, Isaac blessed Jacob. Verse 21, Jacob dying, uh, worshipped. Verse 22, Joseph uh, made mention of the departing and gave commandment. Verse 23, a lot can be said of Moses. By uh, but Moses, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to suffer affliction. He esteemed the reproach better. If you look at the last part of the chapter in verse 33, these individuals, the Bible says in verse 33, they subdued kingdoms, they wrought righteousness, they obtained promises, they stopped the mouths of lions, they quenched the violence of the fire, they escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to uh, fight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection, and others had trials of cruel mocking, and it goes on and on. All of us can say that these examples showed true grit. Amen. Amen. Strong, courageous, not dismayed. But, if you think about it, their grit does not come from their strength or their action, it comes from their faith. If you go back to, again, the beginning of chapter 11. By faith, Abel offered. Verse 5, by faith, Enoch was translated. Verse 7, by faith, Noah moved with fear. By eight, verse 8, by faith, Abraham called to go out, obeyed. Verse 11, through faith, also Sarah received strength. Verse 17, by faith, Abraham Verse 20, by faith, Isaac. Verse 21, by faith, Jacob. 22, by faith, Joseph. 23, by faith, Moses. Verse 31, by faith, the harlot Rahab. Back to our text in verse 33. Who through faith subdued kingdoms? Who through faith wrought righteousness? Through faith obtained promises? Through faith stopped the mouths of lions? Listen, their grit was not on what they did. It was the faith that they had. Their grit was not in their actions. Their grit was not in their response in a way. Their grit was found and formulated in their faith. And in 2 Chronicles chapter 32, <clears throat> Hezekiah tells the people, listen, you need to have true grit. You need to be strong. You need to be courageous. Don't be dismayed. Why? Because the Lord will fight for us. Because the Lord will will deliver us. Let me ask you a question. Do you have enough grit to trust the Lord? A lot of us would rather our grit be founded on what we can do as opposed to what God says he will do. But do you have enough grit to trust God? To trust God with your family? To trust God that he'll take care of you? Do you have enough grit to obtain those promises that God gives to you? And look at this. This is a great thought. The people heard Hezekiah. They saw his focus on the Lord. And the Bible says in verse uh, 8 that the people rested themselves in the words of Hezekiah. Even though they were circling the wagons, and even though the enemy was on the outside wanting to get in, they rested in the words of Hezekiah. Why? Because his words were founded on the Lord. 
because his faith was in the Lord. And they rested even before they fought. They rested even before they had to show strength and great courage. Even though they were dismayed, they rested in the word of Hezekiah. Because Hezekiah gave them a word from God. Now there are times in our life where we're going to see an enemy approaching. Maybe it's something that doesn't really necessarily seem that bad to us. But the devil might use it against us. He might use that to, to steal your heart away from your spouse. Or to steer your heart away from your children. Or just to take you just a little bit farther away from the Lord. Not necessarily a sin, but a weight that's hindering you. Maybe tonight it's time to circle the wagon and say, you know what? You can't use what belongs to me anymore. Maybe there are some tonight you realize, you know, the enemy is just coming in your life however he wants. Your mind is not right. Your heart is not right. Your music's not right. Your life is not right. Your words are not right. Your testimony is not right. All of these things have been trampled on by the devil. And you know what? Maybe tonight you say, I need to start building some walls. I need to start building some walls of separation so the devil can't get into my family. The devil can't get into my life. The devil can't get into my heart. Now remember, when you're building walls, you've got to do those according to the word of God. But maybe there are some areas in your life that you say, you know what, I need to shore up some, some foundations, build up some walls. Maybe tonight there are some people this evening, your focus has been on what you're trying to accomplish and what you're trying to do, and God says, you know what, you just need to leave it with me. You obey me and let me win the victory. You follow me, you go to church, you give like you're supposed to, you do what I've already called you to do, and you let me fight for you. Maybe tonight you just leave it in the Lord's hands. And you know what you can do when that happens? Say, you know what? <laughs> I've tried to show my own grit. I've tried to be a testimony. I've tried to do all the things I can do. You know what? I'm just going to leave it in the Lord's hands. You know what's going to happen? <sighs> There'll be a rest there. Like Troy after lunch by the tent, just chilling in the shade in his lawn chair. There's just a peace there, just a, ah, <sighs> you know what? It's in better hands. When you realize that God is bigger than you, and he's stronger than you, there's a rest that comes. The people rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah. Hezekiah circled the wagons against the enemy, focused on the Lord, and saw great victory. And this afternoon, you can start the road to victory tonight. One man said, Does all the world seem against you? Are you in the battle alone? It's often when you are helpless that God's mighty power is shown. If you want to see God's mighty power in your life tonight, just leave it in his hands. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. And Father, there are so many things in our life that threaten us. There are so many things in our life that want to take our attention and our focus off of you. The world, the flesh, and the devil is against us. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life are warring against us. And there might be some Christians here this afternoon who have given up ground. And maybe they've even given up hope. But Father, help us rest in you this afternoon. Help us do what we can do. Help us begin circling the wagons around our home. Build up those walls of separation. Start getting rid of those areas that may be weighing, weighing us down in the, in the Christian life. And I pray that we can see you have a great victory in our life and in our church even this afternoon. To your son's name we pray. Knowing you can do these things. Amen. Let's all stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed this afternoon. Heads bowed, eyes closed, standing <clears throat> with our heads bowed and eyes closed, no one looking around. As we think about the message, is there anybody here that would say, you know, Kenny, there are things in my life that are not necessarily wrong, but I think the devil's starting to use them against me and against my family. If that's you this afternoon, maybe it's time to get those right and get rid of that weight that thus so easily besets you. Maybe there's some families or some Christians in here this afternoon that say, you know what, there are some walls I have to build because the enemy is getting in. Maybe you can start building those walls this afternoon. Or maybe there's a problem and you've done everything you can do. Now it's time just to show grit by trusting in the Lord. Do you have enough grit to rely on the Lord? As we sing, I have decided to follow Jesus, the Holy Spirit spoke to you. Why don't you come forward and do business with God? As we sing together, you move as we see God work this afternoon. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided 
to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though no one join me, still I will follow. Though no one join me, still I will follow. Though no one join me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back. No turning back. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, think about the message this afternoon. Maybe there's still time to come forward and do business with the Lord. There's still time to build up those walls. There's still time to get rid of those weights and those sins that stuff so easily beset you every single day at work. There's still time. There at your seat, I want you to come forward and get those things right. It's time to circle the wagons. Let's sing one more verse. Many have come. Maybe you still need to come. God's speaking to your heart and I've been there gripping the back of that chair or pew, so I need to go forward, but I'm afraid to. Well, never let fear control your life. Always let fear control your life. Let's sing one more verse, Brother Kenny. Amen. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Amen. Well, great message, amen. amen. And uh, sure glad you stayed. Um, you know, I was thinking, though, uh, there are mission churches. There's even churches in this country. This is how they do Sunday. They have Sunday school, Sunday morning service. They have a meal, and uh, they fellowship, and then they have their, their next service and go home. And uh, I wouldn't want to do that every Sunday, but I think if we did that three or four times a year, that'd be okay. And uh, it's just just a good break. It's refreshing. Uh, we had a good time today. I hope you had a good time. I had a great time. Everybody have a good time today? And, uh, you know, let's pray for these folks that came to the services. And, and uh, if you brought people and they did not come, don't get discouraged. Just say, hey, missed you Sunday. Why don't you come and be with me this Sunday? And uh, ask them to sit with you in church. And uh, we're just praying God will... Uh, bring more of our own members back. We saw some members returning today, and uh, we thank God for the guests that have come every Sunday, too. Don't forget Grow Outreach this week, O-Team, Tuesday night at 6 o'clock. We'll have supper, and then uh, Saturday, if you can't make it, Tuesday night. Wednesday night service at 7. We're going to continue that series out of the book of Proverbs. Uh, this, this Wednesday night, we're planning on preaching about uh, fools and their folly. And uh, you don't want to be a fool. There's five types of fools in the book of Proverbs. And so I hope you'll come. And uh, we have the teen class. We have Patch Club. Ladies Bible study Thursday. This is the last one. You'll be having, uh, uh, what are you calling that? You just pot luck. Pat luck. Everybody brings a pot. You're in luck, okay? And uh, morning and evening services, okay? Let's bow our heads in prayer. And uh, if, 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 you can, if, you, if you signed up to help us with the cleanup, I'm not sure how much got done, how much needs to be done yet. Uh, if you can hang around, help us stack up the tables and chairs, make sure the trash is taken out, and uh, we'll take care of the rest of it when we come back in uh, on Tuesday. Our Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for the, the great and wonderful day that you gave to us, Lord. It really was a, g a good break for us, Father. We needed this. Uh, Lord, we needed the meal. We needed that fellowship time to sit down and just fellowship and talk with each other. And, and uh, Lord, uh, we, re we really miss being able to do that as often as, as we used to. And, uh, Father, I thank you for all the folks who worked so hard uh, this week, Lord, uh, even two weeks ago, Lord, putting things together, making plans and preparations, getting things ready. And, and uh, Lord, the ones who showed up today to help, uh, help set up tables and chairs and put out decorations and, and serve the food, Father, uh, I just pray for your blessings upon all of them. And, uh, Father, we pray for this young man, Jerry, who came forward this morning, Father, who's uh, wants to be saved, but he's got questions. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would continue to speak to him, and uh, I pray that the devil would not be allowed to come along and snatch that seed, that gospel seed, out of his heart. And, uh, Father, may you bless our people. Lord, help them have a good uh, afternoon, a time of rest and refreshment. And, Father, thank you so much for loving us and giving your Son to die on the cross for our sins so that we can have this wonderful gift 
of salvation. And we pray and ask all of these things in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great afternoon.